Can't stop digging Night City. City like any other. Just bigger. Nah, mano. Not just any other city. I feel you, Jackie. It's good to be home. After my first video on Night City, I took a bit of a break from the game, largely because I was having to hyper-focus on whatever project I'd moved on to, but also because I both didn't want to get burnt out on cyberpunk, and I also didn't want to lock myself too hard to a single medium. But even after three months, I can't get the world of Night City out of my head, so like the prodigal son that I am, I've returned, and believe it or not, there is more things that I still want to talk about. Now if you're watching this video, there's a near 100% chance you've seen my first video on Cyberpunk 2077, so it won't come as a surprise to you to hear that I really, really like Night City. I'd probably go so far as to say it's my favorite world in any open world game that I know of. And while in that first video I talk about the emotional value that Night City has for me, I think there's value in discussing things here that I didn't discuss there. Because some people raised some really good questions and comparisons that went beyond what I'd been thinking, and I think we should talk about them. Because I don't just love Night City, even though I'm not supposed to, I think the world of Night City is better than anything else, and I want to tell you why. If you look up the phrase open world arms race, you're gonna get like 12 results. So I'm not the first person to use the phrase, but I will claim to be the first person to set a standard definition for it. The open world arms race, at least for the purpose of this video, refers to the key design choices that make an open world game an open world game, and for the purpose of this video, we'll be referring to it as three separate sections, with the basic ideas being understanding the world's size, the world's vibe, and how that world uses its empty spaces. The games that showcase the best features and elements in these three categories are our metaphorical superpowers, but don't confuse being a popular game with being a frontrunner. Plenty of games can be popular while only doing one or two of these elements well. Very few games nail all three, and those that do often experience poaching. Like all arms races, it's fun when it starts small, and we tend to use cutesy words like innovative or breaking new ground. Like how the first Assassin's Creed game had all those neat towers for Altair to climb. They made a lot of sense in that game, but the wretched truth is that things that make sense in their own games will be taken and used in other projects. Not because that technique perfectly fits that project, but just because it works well enough. Which is why they've got us climbing towers to unlock sections on the map in basically every open world these days. So as arms races grow, so too does the Fallout. Speaking of which, Fallout. And it's our biggest one yet. It is four times the size of Fallout 4. Oh Todd. Sweet, sweet Todd. Someday you'll give us Elder Scrolls 6 and it will be beautiful and perfect and I can stop dunking on you for the sins of your past. But it is not this day. What Mr. Howard here is showcasing is the first sign of sickness in the open world arms race, an obsession with size. The map is very big, but the issue with a very big map is that you need things on it for the players to interact with, otherwise there's no game. And so you make a thing for the players to interact with, but that takes time. And you make a few more things for the players to interact with and suddenly even more time is gone. But you've already made the map so big, the whole purpose of this game was so that Todd could say the words four times the size. But the time you have is coming down to the wire, and more and more you're starting to understand how empty this world is going to feel. There's just no way you can fill a world this big to 100% capacity with things and content worth seeing or interacting with. But you don't sweat it, because you know, with two easy afternoon projects you can cover up all the boring things you don't want the players to see, and you can cram the world full of life. It's time for fast travel and random events. Let's tackle these one at a time. A random event, for the purpose of this video, is classified as any non-scripted event designed to make the world look like there's something going on in it, like the world is alive. When a dog approaches me on the road to solitude and says, Please help me. My master was kidnapped by Forsworn. Only for Serana to start fighting the dog once we get there, essentially softlocking the quest and ruining the entire purpose of this journey? That's a random event. 
When I'm traveling through Hyrule and some suspiciously innocuous traveler is suspiciously waiting for gaming's favorite twink to wander by so that they can get dunked on by people that have memorized this event so hard that for it to have any entertainment value we need to hit them with a log at Mach 19, sending them not just into orbit but sending them into orbit as a cloud of barely held together atomic dust, you know that's a random event. When me and the boys are trying to push back eternal ice and snow by keeping the winter tot at bay and trying to pick up the fly's fuck pyromancer outfit as thanks from the pyromancers were helping, only for this small furry piece of shit to kidnap me and make me catch him food so that he can enjoy the sun's rays with a full belly, believe it or not, that's a random event. Although to be fair, RuneScape's random events were originally made to be early level anti-macroing agents, 2005 Jagex didn't give a shit if you found them fun. Now, I don't want to come across as if I dislike random events. Random events, as mechanics for fleshing out and adding sustenance to open world games, are fine. I think they're fine. Their main issue is that, like the real content of the game, you can only make so much of them. Which means, depending on how long you're expecting the player to spend in the world, people are going to start noticing the pattern, seeing the same event more and more, and the more people notice the repetition, the less it feels like game, and the more it feels like what it is, just the RNG of the game pulling a handful of predetermined assets to place just outside of vision and wait for you to walk by. You know what I'm gonna find in here? I'm calling it right now. We're about to find Meridia's Beacon. It doesn't mean they're not fun, but it doesn't mean they spark joy either. They're low budget, low cost, low reward. But if they're the best you can do, you might as well do them. So here's what I love about Night City. It turns away from having random events and focuses more on set dressing that changes around the world. And one of the reasons it can do this is because Night City wasn't born with any lofty ambitions about it being X times the size of Y game. It was designed to be a very specific size, that being exactly the size it needed to be. And because it was built around this premise, it means that if I Google Night City random events, the only thing I get is a Gamerant article talking about rare encounters that are all just genuinely scripted events. Like, hey Joseph, you can't just take a beat from the main story of the game and call it a rare encounter. That's not... that's not what that means, man. Come on. But Night City's design also means that there's no real need to try and fill it with things to keep it interesting or get me around it faster to skip all the boring bits. Remember, the point of random events is to make the world feel alive, but if the world is sized well and already feels like a real place, there's no need to try and fluff it up. Likewise, fast travel is a tool to give the players to let them skip over the boring, uninteresting part of an open world game space. If there's no boring, uninteresting spaces, fast travel doesn't get used, and I make a debut video talking about how I didn't even know it existed in your game. I strongly believe that there's a direct correlation between the quality of world design and the amount of use that fast travel gets. I still walk and drive around Night City after 161 hours. By that time in Skyrim, I had already started using COC console commands to just teleport to where I'm going. Night City feels like such great representation of how to make a game world feel real because honestly, a bunch of people walking to wherever they're going is what makes me think of a real world. When some chromed up chooms are sitting outside the afterlife, clearly burnt out on life in Night City but still just staying here, I feel that. When I leave 7th Hell and I see some beat cops running a little investigation on a drive-by, I can see the real world reflected in that, because that's the kind of thing that happens in the real world. It didn't need to be anything special, it didn't need to be an assassin in disguise or some little pop-up event. It just needed to be the world I recognize, wrapped up in neon. I remember the first time I played Fallout 3. I was 17 at the time, and my friend then had been really pushing me to try it. It was, they said, one of their favorite games, and they knew that I would enjoy it. I played the intro, escaped the vault, and walked out to this? These four different tones of gray, green, brown, and black? For the whole world? Of course, fast forward almost a decade later, and oh god, the vibrancy. Like, really though, have you ever seen a world with colors this good? Have you ever seen a world look this rich? What a feast for the eyes, what prismatic radiance, how gloriously incandescent. Now I'm not going to tell you that graphics are everything, but they really contribute to the vibe of any game, both in how good they are and how they're used. But vibes goes beyond just color. Aesthetic and architecture are huge elements when it comes to making an open world game feel like a real place, and understanding how those two interact with each other are perhaps the most important thing you can do when creating a world. So let's discuss each one individually, because, surprise, I hit a smaller list within this video's main list. 
Aesthetic is the least hard definable of the two because it's the foremost vibe check. It's the kind of thing you don't really notice unless it's done really well or really poorly. Essentially, we're looking at the idea of if this world feels like it's supposed to. White Run is supposed to be the central trade hub for the entire nation of Skyrim, and that's represented by a traveling band of merchant Khajiits that also goes to every other town, and also these three stalls, which is the same number of stalls as Solitude, but also has a huge port? And Windhelm, also with three stalls and a massive port? How about the fact that Riften has four stalls? And like, yes, okay, one of those stalls is only used for the Thieves Guild to sling their snake oil bullshit, but in this house we call that a hustle, and we respect the hustle. But it can be a little more complex than that. For a second example, let's head to Winterhold's college. Literally before writing the sentence, I guessed that there were nine people at the college. Plot twist on me, there's actually sixteen, nearly double what my gut instinct told me. Plus, the number of beds in the two college halls is 17. Plus, the bed in the Archmage's quarters makes 18. Which means that not only is this place more filled than I thought it was, it's also built around nearly exactly what it's supposed to be. So why does it feel so dead? Well, because it is. The big thing about Winterhold as a city is that most of it fell into the ocean. A lot of the wreckage can still be seen in the depths of the fissure that separates the city from the college. There were only eight buildings that were unaffected by the disaster, except four of them recently burned to the ground. This whole place feels hollow and empty, even though it was built around its size because its aesthetic is perfect. This whole city, what remains of it, is less of a city and more of a dying, tired thing, desperately gasping for each new breath. And seemingly collectively, the rest of Skyrim is just content with this. No interest in helping, no regard for Winterhold's Jarl or their decisions. Honestly, I first looked at Winterhold as another takedown opportunity, but I'll be the first to admit I was wrong with that. Winterhold feels empty, sure, but what else could it feel like? Back-to-back -back disasters bringing a once great state low, now only struggling to make any sort of footing whatsoever? A people desperate for a chance or a life that's never coming because it's easier to just pretend that Winterhold doesn't exist? Winterhold nails its vibe check. I just wish the rest of Skyrim did too. Of course, if I'm looking for an entire world that nails its vibe check, I just walk out the front door of this apartment. While aesthetic is the vibe check, architecture is a little more concrete. In fact, sometimes it's literally concrete. Architecture is the structure of a world, how the world looks, what its build and design is, the storytelling done with no words. The fact that I can tell that Bellathor's is a good place to rob because there's a loot shadow mark carved into a shop's exterior. I mean, this is where Whiterun shines. Typically the first city we see in this game, a game modeled after Viking culture and it sits in the middle of a massive plains biome? Model it after Edoras. And you know what? Take the Viking longship we used to get here and throw it on top of the Companion's Hall. The physical build of Whiterun could not be any more on brand. Now, some people in my first cyberpunk video asked why I didn't talk about the Assassin's Creed games. After all, their worlds are built in a very similar genre to Night City, and you know what? They're exactly right. That's a very good point. In fact, I think Black Flag is a great example of a world that nails it on both aesthetic and architecture. Black Flag is a bit of a black sheep when it comes to being an Assassin's Creed game, but I think that does good things for it here. It lets the game explore new themes and ideas, and I think it pulls those themes off big time. Specifically, I love this tropical locale. I mean, I feel warm when I play this game. And when I roll into Havana for the first time, to its credit, it does genuinely feel like a real world. And even though I love Night City, I don't think there's any individual point of Cyberpunk 2077 that hits the same highly specific, very niche, utter delight that is the sea shanties. Look at them. Not a phone in sight. Just a bunch of boys living in the moment. Oh, the times were hard and the wages low. Leave a Johnny, leave a I guess it's time for us to go. And it's time for us to leave her. I genuinely think this game was a huge part of what inspired the sea shanty era of the pandemic storyline. So much of this game's OST was centered around these shanties, which means we got incredible AAA quality renditions of old, essentially folk music. And when you consider that being in lockdown and being stuck on a ship crossing the Atlantic are functionally identical, it hardly seems like a coincidence that sea shanties snuck their way into cultural relevancy. In short, they fucking slap, and I like them a lot. So if I'm such a big fan of the vibe of this world, why didn't I talk about it originally?
Well, the full truth is that I didn't think to include Assassin's Creed games in the first video is because I fucking hate Assassin's Creed games. And the reason I hate Assassin's Creed games is... Bro, this world feels like garbage to interact with. Assassin's Creed games all have this same method of parkour-based movement. It means that all of the places you can go are also filled with what feels like predetermined snapping points for your character's movement. And in Black Flag, I'm used to my character more so trying to navigate to these prefabricated snapping points for the game's movement system than actually responding to what I'm intending. This is the kind of thing you only notice when it's in the top 10% or utter garbage. 70% of the time, you won't really think about the game's movement or its actions, but when it stands out in either direction, you're going to feel it. And look, I know that the real problem I have with the game is that it decided to make E be the button to drop, but I'm so ingrained into the most basic movement control for both first and third person games, that being press W to go forward, and forward is where the camera is facing, and quite frankly, I just can't get the muscle memory to sit side seat to Black Flag shenanigans. And you know what I really love in my games? When I'm constantly pulled out of any scrap of immersion from my high seas pirate assassin adventure to live the thrilling high octane experience of working in an office with substantially different sensitivity settings. Of course, it doesn't do the game any yeah. favors that I'm already burnt out by the time I get into Havana. Seriously, why do I need to sign into a second program if I already own the game on Steam? Why do I need to connect to your servers if I'm just gonna play a single player game? What do you mean this isn't my password? I opened this launcher literally once a decade at this point, there's no way I've changed it recently. What do you mean I can't use a recent password as a new password? That means the thing that you just told me wasn't my password is my password. I don't think about Assassin's Creed games, because I try really hard not to think about Assassin's Creed games. They're full of little tiny fingers that press all of my little tiny buttons we do not get along. But you know what Assassin game I do get along with? Dishonored. Now you might say, Fane, Dishonored isn't an open world game, it has linear level design and specific areas where you can and can't go, that's not a fair comparison. And I might say, don't make me tap the sign. In reality, of course, you would be correct. Dishonored is only an open world game if you squint at it upside down. It might wear some of the colors, but not the whole uniform. Regardless, if we want to talk about a world that feels incredible to be in, we gotta talk about Dishonored. Because every bit of this game is based around its movement. Ledges and jumps are all just the right height and distance to be made by Corvo. The running is good, the slide is good, the magic we use to traverse the world, it all just feels... so good. And while it's accessible to any person, the people who dive deep into this game and its mechanics are basically literal wizards with how many different methods and techniques they're able to work with, the chains and combos of different powers. It's nuts. Of course, it falls apart a little bit once you slow it down. Actual combat in this game doesn't get the same level of depth that the movement does, but I think that's on purpose. Dishonored is, after all, a game about stealth and being an assassin. I won't fault the devs for designing a system of open one-on-one -on -one combat that doesn't feel perfect. That's not the function of the game. But it's still something allowed to the player, and it doesn't feel great unless you're one of the wizards. Here's what I love about Night City and all of this. This world feels like a world, and it looks like a world, and it all just works. I mean, okay, like, the driving is a little funky, but I don't love Night City because I think it's the unrivaled peak in all three of aesthetic, architecture, and action. It doesn't have Dishonored's clean-as-fuck movement, and it doesn't have the incredible aesthetic of Black Flag shanties. But it also doesn't have the same weakness that those other games have, or at least not to the same level. I really believe that in terms of the quality of its world, Cyberpunk 2077 has the highest floor out of any game that I know of. Because while the movement isn't as good as Dishonored, it's capable of being in the same vein. And while there's no shanties, I do occasionally hear Stay at Your House play on an in-game radio and start crying, so it has that going for it. The aesthetic of Night City isn't just the neon gods of Corpo Plaza or the emotional heft of Edgerunners, it's the fact that walking down these stairs for the first time and hearing the conversations of people around me and seeing the crowd and the sun and my boy Jackie having a snack while he waits for me, it's looking out this window and basking in the towering heights of the city that makes me realize this world feels exactly like it's supposed to, but it also looks exactly like it's supposed to. The neon is everything to me, sure, I'm biased towards it, but one step outside the neon and you get... this. Open world games, regardless of their power level within the arms race, all come with a certain amount of empty space. Places within the game where there's just not much for the player to interact with. 
And if you've made it this far in the video, you can probably understand that I don't think empty space is, in general, a good thing. But that doesn't mean that empty space is always a bad thing. Depending on how the game uses it, it can heavily inform what this game is about. Take for example Fallout 3. While its color scheme genuinely bores me, the use of empty space in the world makes sense. It doesn't inherently feel like this map is left open just to make it large enough so that Todd can say the line, but rather this is a world ravaged by nuclear warfare. There's just not much left here, and the game's purposeful underdevelopment of its open areas makes sure you know it. Of course, jump forward a few years and you've got the entire Fallout 76 subreddit asking if there's anything to even do in the game, so clearly something went wrong somewhere, and it wasn't just the radiation. Personally, I think no game I've ever played has a better understanding of the use of its open space than Cyberpunk 2077. Night City is dense and tall and imposing. The verticality of this world is a very specific design point. This world does not crawl, it climbs, because if you go too far from the city, suddenly there's nothing here to crawl towards. The world is dead. And while there's a few pockets of metaphorical oasis in a small rundown motel that even Johnny says literally makes no sense to exist other than it being good for use as a den of illegal activity, you won't find people thriving out here any more than you will in the city. You'll die in the desert, or you'll die in the streets. But if you choose the streets, at least there's neon. The thing that interests me most in the Badlands is its clear and stark contrast from Night City. I feel like most cities have their towering districts, but they reach outward eventually and tower a little less, and then you'll find apartments and small residentials, and slowly that will fade into smaller and smaller communities, but Night City... When I think about the Badlands outside city limits, I actually think about this intersection. I drove through it so many times in my original 150 hours that it's now permanently set in my brain as the gateway to the Badlands. And the thing that I think really hits me so hard about it is that you go from Night City to Open Waste, and if you even blink or have the mod that makes bikes go faster, you might miss the transition. In reality, the Badlands and Night City tend to bleed into each other. Nomads come into the city for work from time to time, and the worst of Night City occasionally takes a day trip to some small-time doctor out in the wilds, but that first moment of leaving Night City proper and hitting total, open, empty space, trading neon light for the dark of an empty night, nothing's ever done it better. The open world arms race, like any good arms race, doesn't have a definite end. In fact, it's really more of a contest, a show-and-tell science fair of creativity and coding. And we meet every year to see what's new to the market or what's new to us. Right now, Night City takes home the Best in Show award. Not for having wildly high peaks in all categories, but just for being real. For understanding that an above-average floor is better than high peaks and low troughs. For understanding that bright lights and a walkable city are sometimes all it really takes to make me feel at home even if those bright lights are just so many different adverts for weird bullshit that I'd never even remember having seen. But the truth is that Night City only wins for so long as that it's the best at what it does, and the world and its mechanics still aren't flawless. A best-in-show award is not the same as being heralded from lofty heights of unobtainable reaches. Inevitably, something else will come along. It won't be GTA V, because I've already played it and don't like it, but maybe I'll finally play Red Dead Redemption 2, like people said I should in the first video. Maybe something new will come out. Maybe I'll find something that's new to me. But until that day comes, I just can't stop digging Night City.